Um, so um, thank you very much for our invitation. Um, so um, I've been doing um, AI uh, at least uh, during my bachelor's uh, thesis in Kenya University. I wrote uh, my first AI application. Um, this was on neural network in 2007 at the Department of Mathematics uh, when I started doing um, neural networks in Kenya University. Uh, AI has developed over the years, and so it's interesting seeing that there are many now, many alternatives, many options that are coming into the space. And so it's very important that we also kind of understand the whole perspective on this um, AI space. I'll be talking about artificial intelligence for sustainable development. This is particular, this is a, a, a topic of special interest to me because of the need for AI to accelerate uh, these sustainable development goals. Uh, so even in the university here at uh, UCC, uh, we are starting um, a center for uh, AI for sustainable development goals, of which I'm the lead uh, proposer for this center as well. Uh, so I wear many hats. Uh, I'm a lecturer at the Department of Mathematics, uh, co-founder and director of programs for Ghana Natural Language Processing. And then just uh, two weeks ago, also we co-founded the Coastal Artificial Intelligence uh, in Ghana as well. And I'll try to share some of the works that we are doing. So I'll be going through some of the things that are really critical uh, in the areas of AI and sustainable development goals. Uh, so talk briefly on open data. This is a very important topic as well uh, that anyone who wants to come into the AI space must um, understand uh, what open data is and what they, are go what they are getting into. They must understand some aspects of them. Uh, then I'll talk about AI and then the both uh, the one when open data meets AI, talk about some of the use cases and then some of the opportunities in the future uh, that we can all share in. So open data, um, what, where and why? Uh, there's a legal framework um, on open data. Uh, there's a data governance, there's a data quality framework and then I'll talk about advantages and disadvantages of open data. And then uh, some data farmers and what open data, some uh, examples of open data that are available. So for people who want to do research, who want to develop products and tools, um, if they want to use open data, what are some of the data that are already available they can use? So open data is data that anyone can use, uh, you can access, use, and share. These are three, three important words, uh, access, use, and share. And then the idea is already borrowed from open source. So open source usually, uh, in open source, we just uh, share all the, the development that we do, we share it out there for anybody to use, uh, also to have access to and to share and develop further. And it becomes usable when uh, it is made available in a common machine readable format. So if you have an open data and it is not readable by anyone, then it's not open data because nobody can use it. No one can have access to it. So even if they can have access to it, they cannot use it. So this is not uh, open data. So it must be usable and uh, machine readable in a machine readable format. And it must be licensed. The fact that it is open data doesn't mean that it is not licensed. It must be licensed. Every data that you put out there, you must put a license to it. So this is very important. And there are several, um, uh, if we talk about open source, we know a lot of these open source initiatives, um, Joomla, WordPress, um, Joomla, WordPress, Magento, uh, Java, Ubuntu, these are all some of open source. So if you know open source, you can think already of some of these um, uh, products that are out there that we say they are open source. It means anybody can use it, anybody can have access to it, you can share it, you can develop your products out of them as well. So um, what is open data? Um, open data really enables us to use data in new ways that may dif differ from the original use. And then the data is 
is the raw material from which information and knowledge can be derived. Data becomes information when it is given a context. So you you get uh, you you have open data. Sometimes you collect you collect your data for something specific. Uh, but if you make it open, then you you enable the community. You enable more people to have access to the data. And some people will be able to use the data for something that you probably never thought of. And that is the, the essence of uh, sharing data. And this is the essence of why we try to uh, sometimes uh, encourage people to share their data. Excuse me. To share their data so that people can have access to it and so that people can use it maybe in ways that nobody even imagined. And this brings out innovation, it, it keeps research going, and it keeps a lot of other things uh, coming into the system that improves our personal lives and, uh, and the whole uh, general being in all. So, so example, someone collects data on the weather, um, another person collects data on doctor's appointments, then they can use the weather to connect doctor's appointments uh, in a way that they can tell the stories that maybe when the weather is like this, the, the doctor's appointments are low or you shouldn't go to see the doctor. So these are the ways that we, we kind of share open data. And then the knowledge that is derived from information and personalized for your use uh, is what you use what you get from this kind of open data. So we say that data is open if anyone can access, use and share it. It means that there is no limitations. It must be free to use. And accessing fee must be less than reproduction cost. It means that if you collect data today on maybe market women, uh, and someone else wants to collect the same data maybe in two years' time, um, the issue of uh, free does not necessarily mean that you can use it without paying. It just means that you can also put a token even on it such that uh, the cost of reproducing such data um, what the person will consider using your data than reproducing such data again. So that is what we mean by must be free to use and accessing fee must be less than reproduction costs. So free to use, reuse and redistribute it even commercially. So open data really brings diverse benefits to governments, businesses, researchers and so on. And so you can think of if you want to, if we want to probably even understand government governance, uh, if our government releases data, maybe from finance, from economics, from health, it is possible to tell the stories and it's possible to connect um, which part of the country, uh, which part of our society needs some improvement or which part of our society needs help. And uh, especially if you go to our hospitals, if we can connect the data, we can help pharmaceuticals even improve um, what kind of medications to concentrate on and what kind of diseases are prevalent. So these are transforming governments is one of the use cases of open data governance. It reduces corruption. If we all know how much gov government is using uh, by the data, by the amount of money is being, we are aware Then it reduces these uh, ideas. And it creates new opportunities, as I already said. For instance, if the government decides to make its health data public for Ghanaians, a lot of Ghanaians can come up with different uh, nice ideas on how to what to do in the health sector. And this is actually will create new businesses. It will help to inform pharmaceuticals what medications to produce. So this is what we mean. And then climate change in general. So it helps us, it will help us to know how much of um, how much we are contributing to gas or to the climate change, uh, how much trees we are planting. If we say we are doing planting for food and jobs, or we are doing, uh, we, we decide to create a day for planting. If we tell how many trees we have really planted, it can tell us how much of um, carbon dioxide or oxygen we are contributing or taking out of the system. And this is how uh, we can we use open data to transform um uh, government uh, climate change uh, there are many types of licensing on data so data if you say your data is open it does as i always say it, is, it doesn't mean that it is free uh, there are many licenses to it um so there are open data licensing there are attribution licensing 
their public domain dedication and licenses as well. So your data must always come with a license. Um, it can be copyright, all rights reserved, or creative commons, some rights are reserved, or public domain, no rights is reserved. So um, these are things that are, are really important for people who are creating data, or who want to go into open data, either to use someone's data or to produce and put out there your own data for use for by others as well. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages in open data? Um, of course, as I've already described, it increases transparency, reduces corruption, interpreting interpretation of data, because you collect your data for A, another person will, will understand it in a different context. And it all helps. Um, accessibility of data, data is readily available. Everybody can use it. We can work with it. It increases research. It increases uh, many other things in our society. Uh, maybe funding as well. Yes, uh, there's funding. A lot of, lot of government or uh, international bodies uh, out there throwing out money for people to collect data and make it accessible, open data. But um, some of the cons are issues of privacy and consent. Um, in more recent times, a lot of people are not excited, for instance, by open AI. Uh, because uh, people who made their data openly accessible uh, now have to go and pay to access OpenAI or chat GPT uh, from OpenAI, for instance. So these are the privacy and consent issues as well. Um, I remember even for us, uh, Ghana NLP, um, we had a case, a similar case like that. We started using someone's open data and we did not check the license well. So after we develop the product, the person sends a message and says, take my, take my data out because you cannot use it. So the cons are cost and sustainability. If you create an open data and you say it is free, everybody can use it. The question is, how are you going to maintain your data? How are you going to uh, make sure that your data is always available and forever available for anybody who wants to use or anybody who is already using your data? So in Africa, there are many, many open open data uh, um, projects going on. There's the Africa Open uh, DEL deal. There's the Data Hub. Um, there's a Digital Earth Africa. There's Open Data Burkina Faso. There's Nigeria Open Data Access. There's a West African Science Services Center on Climate Change and Adaptive Land Use. Also have a lot of data on climate change and plants and diseases animals and so on so um for us here in the in the, in the university of cape coast uh we also started um when i moved here i started developing a, a b map so the b map uh we took uh we have 30 years of b data from ghana that we are able to visualize and we're able to tell um the migration patterns of bees for instance and this will help you this if you really study it well tells you that um, why certain areas are losing out on on farming and why certain areas are increasing in farming and because these bees are pollinators they help they help um they help yield they help crop yield so if they move from one place to another then there's a loss uh in crop yield and these are the kind of things that uh the data can tell or the story data can tell and they so we we have developed this b map and of course it's not the only one uh we are we are increasing this map and we are going it's not going to be a b map but uh, an entomology map so map of a lot of insects that help in uh in food crop yield uh, that we are trying to study and that has been studied in ghana for over many years so we'll be mapping them and we will we'll be seeing uh, even for this B map, we already see the migration pattern. And this is really um, sustainable development issues because it talks of food security. And the migration pattern of these bees tells either there are some substances being used in some of these areas for farming that is harmful these, to these uh, pollinators, so they migrate away. So this is uh, something that we're doing. So uh, example, if you look into, you can see the type of bees um, uh where it was collected 
how many uh, you can actually tell all the different types of bee species uh, even in ghana and this is uh, something that we are currently working on so example if you click on one of them you see um the genus the year it was collected the size of the bee um the the the, the sex whether it's male or female the plant it was seen on so this is really a very very um uh, detailed uh, map that we are now using to develop uh helping us to guide us uh, in seeing migration patterns of bees and then also food sustainability as well so um artificial intelligence uh, what is artificial intelligence it has actually come up as a result of the emergence of this huge big data um of course there are some pros and cons and then I'll talk also briefly on responsible AI and some applications uh, now. So uh, sometimes I get people asking me, uh, is, it, is AI for only mathematics people? And I tell them, uh, nowadays you can do AI without knowing anything about maths. Uh, you just have to learn how to write the right codes. And that is all that you need. So everybody is invited. Everybody can do it uh, by getting the right training. So... Um, uh, it's really important that for Africa, we begin to see it as a very good thing um, because already as of December 2021, the global AI market was about 15 billion uh, US dollars. By 2025, the AI market is expected to grow to about 200 billion market, uh, US dollars. And by 2023, AI is expected to increase global GDP by 14%. This means that the acceleration, AI is giving a certain level of acceleration to decision making, uh, to, to product development that is enhancing human health or human life or helping us grow right plants and crops. And however, the sad thing is that uh, the AI market uh, in Africa is about 66 million. Uh, so you can compare that the global market is about 50 billion but in africa we are the, the whole ai market is about 66 million which is very very little or almost nothing compared to the to the global contribution of ai so um what i want you to take away is uh, um ai uh, is not is really just a simulation of human intelligence in machines uh, that are programmed to think like humans and mimic their actions um so i remember you watched this football match um uh, germany against japan uh, or something like that or spain against japan one of them uh, where everybody said the ball had crossed the line or the ball did not cross the line um if it was if we if we're still living in the olden days probably the referee could have used this question and said the ball crossed the line and then there's just no goal but nowadays because of technology var introduction of var which can tell if the ball has crossed the line or not, or if it was an offside or not. Uh, these are they are little marginal things that the eye cannot see, uh, or we cannot actually perceive. So AI introduction uh, will help really uh, alleviate some of these things and help us develop uh, in a better way um, in that sense. Um, so what about this one? Is it an offside or not? You can see how very small it is that maybe a human eye will not probably have seen it but uh, with a var is able to detect that really there was a very very marginal offside that was created so these are the things that ai um, is doing to improve even things like football that we all love and sometimes can create death because of such marginal decisions that have gone wrong and then I, I'm, I don't know if you remember during the World Cup, uh, someone had said that they could predict who will win the World Cup uh, just by using the data resistance. So this is also what I also say that um, our core predictability um, is sometimes when it comes to the humans, there are a bit of some errors or uh, heuristics. You cannot tell if the person will behave the same way he's doing tomorrow and today. So those are some of the disadvantages and one must always consider them. So I'll talk briefly about responsible AI. When we have AI systems act auto autonomously in our world, eventually our AI systems will make our decisions better as I've already shown you some examples. 
all we need to do is to ensure that the purpose that we put into the machine is the purpose which we really want this is what norbert said in 1960 because sometimes you develop uh you develop a product or you develop a product you want it to act in a but then it tends to act in b or you took you play you take your data out you put your data out there maybe for houses or demographics in ghana and then 10 years to come america wants to bomb you they already have your data they can put in the houses it just comes directly and bombs you out so those are responsible ai that we are now trying to fight it and figure out what are the real things that we should use the data for what are the things that you cannot use the data for so uh, principles of responsible ai is if you are developing an ai you must think about the interpretability, the fairness, the safety, and the privacy. And this is what we do for accountability. Sometimes, um, of course, sometimes uh, there are biases as well. Um, example, uh, there was this news, I'm not sure if you saw it, uh, in 2021, where Twitter finds racial bias in image cropping AI tools or something like this. The best algorithms struggle to recognize black faces equally. And these are kind of the biases. And I'm not sure if you remember this one. This was in 2009 when this guy, uh, when the HP developed a camera for the laptop, but it could not recognize a black face, but it could recognize a white face. So these are kind of biases that uh, can come up uh, in things like AI. I'll talk about some applications. So um, we have the Kaya. Kaya AI, which is developed by Ghana NLP, and it's named after the Kaya tree. Um, and then we started by developing this uh, translator for Ghanaian languages, I would say. So we started with um, uh, a Kapim tree. We did also for Ghana and Ebe. Then we, we went a bit outside of Ghana to Nigeria to do one for Yoruba. And then we went to Kenya to do for Kiswahili. And so now we, we, we change it from Ghanaian trans languages to African languages, because now we are introducing other African languages uh, from Burkina Faso, from other from Kenya, and from other South African languages as well. Uh, for both test and speech is what we are now doing uh, at Ghana NLP, uh, together with uh, Algorand, we are developing this tool as well. So. Uh, Kaya improves uh, over time by user, uh, uh, so it is an app, we have an app for it, so this is the app, you can download it online, uh, or it's also, we have a dashboard as well that you can use it if you don't want to download on uh, uh, online. Uh, we use a feedback uh, feedback uh, to improve our learning. Uh, you, when you go there, you put in your sentence, uh, you check if the sentence is perfectly translated you can score it maybe nine ten eight five uh, if it is not the best you can make a suggestion for improvement and then this goes back into our data and helps to improve the model for training and for the translation as well uh, our aim is to be sustaining a resource for africans in the digital future uh, now we translate three ever done Europe as well um uh, we tested against Facebook and um, Google's um, translators on local languages, Ghanaian languages, and we know that we outperform them based on the metrics uh, metrics that we use. We know that we have performed them. And now, as I said, we are doing now concentrating a bit on the automatic speech recognition as well. Um, so for climate change, um, there are a lot of um, so resources are there. Google has already developed some tools for detecting plant diseases. Um, we have tested this as well. And so I'll talk briefly about what we're also doing here at Coastal AI that I spoke about earlier. So climate change, uh, people are doing precision agriculture. Also in UCC, uh, we are doing some precision, agri precision agriculture using AI to tell plant yield or to tell uh, whether the crop is growing well or not. Uh, these are things that are important. And also, um, you can use it for weather forecasting is now being really helpful. AI is using to uh, now predict uh, weather for farmers, um, also for soil improvement. 
So usually um, people do NPK improvement of the soil, but now you can do an IoT, putting some uh, sensors in the floor, uh, in the soil, that tells you the kind of how much of uh, each of the and sodium, potassium, or nitrogen that you really need for your crops or for your soil. So these are the things that AI is doing. Um, in Ghana, I'm sure we, we know of uh, Isoko, we know of Farmerline, these are all in the, in the agri space. Uh, there's Agro Center, there's Olam. These are now some, Af uh, in, in general, across Africa, there are all these uh, businesses uh, that are coming up uh, around AI. People are building tools that is helping improve farm life or helping improve health life, uh, like Mino Health uh, or Kara Agro. There are a lot of things that are now increasingly coming up to improve our lives uh, for food safety or for our health in general and also for education in general as well. So what are the opportunities? The opportunities are that um, uh, the opportunities for training and development is, is still there, is still available. Um, unfortunately, um, there is very little going on in Ghana. The, it looks like the same things are happening, but there are several opportunities out there, even for product development grad, and product development. So not just even after your bachelor studies or during your bachelor's training, you can still start trying to develop a product. And there are many products. You can develop chatbots. You can develop uh, apps for many things that are that will that will use AI. And these are all possibilities. So, and sometimes what are, we should try to collaborate. I feel in the future there's going to be more collaboration. I hope between researchers or people out there in the market, and then people in the university who are interested in also developing these. Uh, AI and, and improving on research as well. So, um, of course, I, I forgot to mention, so at Coastal AI, uh, together we are doing this plant aid, which is also for uh, plant disease detection uh, for about 12, 12 plants in Ghana, staple crops in Ghana that we are now developing. We've almost done the first phase and the app will be out also very soon. So. Uh, sustainable development and AI, we can use this to AI to facilitate uh, migration of animals towards food safety, um, to translate languages and also for disease detection, either in humans or in crops, uh, we can use all these things. So thank you very much uh, for being here. If you have any questions, I'll be online to take them. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore, for your time. I really appreciate that. But I mean, before, so guys, the floor is open. You can put your, if you have a question you want to ask, you can raise your hand or just put the question in the chat and I will read it to Dr. Moore for him to answer. But I, I want to ask this, this question. First of all, what got you interested in the field of artificial intelligence and what, why did you, who found Ghana NLP? Yeah, so um, as I said, um, I, when I was in KUS in 2006, um, I, I did my bachelor project work uh, using neural network to determine um, diseases uh, at Confanochi. That was, that was my first uh, instance of uh, really coming into artificial intelligence. In fact, that time it was not really even a popular field. I, I'm sure many people didn't even know about it. And <laughs> but I, I knew the potential of this uh, even that time already. Um, so I have already I've, since then I've been very interested in this development. Thankfully, the development of things like um, PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow has made it quite really easily for easy for many people to jump in and to access already developed tools that they can use uh, at a very good uh, in a in an easy way to and so and then the development of computational power you know access to computational power also has helped improve this field a lot uh, so uh, i saw already uh, i quite remember during my bachelor studies what my lecture my teacher what my lecturer was asking me I should use it to predict little numbers so that they can be rich. <laughs> right. So this is where um, 
but the idea was that it could, you, we could already 2007 we could use it to predict um uh, children who are going to confirm uh the deaths and births are the those who live and those who die out of malaria and right. it, it really presented a very powerful thing to me and so uh, over the years of course i've been out of ghana i came back and together with paul uh, we started this whole idea of ghana nlp actually from paul's idea of nlp so the nlp is really that i mean when you are when you are when you live in a country where there are several languages or you 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 learn another language uh, you realize immediately that language translation is very powerful uh because it affects the culture it, it, it makes you understand the culture if you go to germany and you speak german with them immediately they recognize you as someone who understands the culture and so translation of languages for me was very important even in ghana to be able to translate across our own languages uh without even using english so it means the opportunity to translate from tree to ever directly uh will be very very in, in, intuitive and very very in, interesting and for me that's where we started from the idea that we wanted to translate the languages right. And create and also that that kind of preserves the culture and that also improves the culture and gives uh, the future people or the future generation the ability to realize that um, this is how we lived and this is what we did because already some languages are going into extension um, and so it's important that once you do the translation the data is there and it will never go into extension because you can always go and refer it or write it and use it again. So this is where we started, or this is where the main interest uh, came for developing Ghanaian language uh, translator. Awesome, awesome. Um, so I have some questions in the chat, but but I wanted to follow up with, based on what you said and ask that since you've been, how, how has Kaya um affected the space i know i, I checked the app and it has over fifty thousand downloads um on the on the on the play store i'm not sure about the app store but based on use usage how what what have you identified what have you what have you guys learned over the period of um the time that you launched kaya and how impactful has it been since you deployed it yeah so um I, uh, so it was actually very surprising as well because when we developed, when we launched it, I quite remember some pharmacists, uh, uh, some pharmaceuticals uh, in US who told us that they've been coming to Ghana and going to some villages um, to try to do some uh, health outreach and other stuff like that. And some of the things they really struggled was how to communicate with the people. So they always needed someone to go with them. To explain to them some of the things that the people were saying and they felt that this was really a good uh, something that was innovative that you we, they can use and so uh, it means that we are continually improving it uh, even for in specific areas like medicine you need special words and we are trying to translate it also um, i realized that um, since we started developing it's it's already made me aware that uh, the our Ghanaian language is not really strong and it may actually um, be replaced by a lot of English or uh, other uh, some some coinage words so because the fact that we do not really develop we are not developing our own languages our languages mm. what the mm. development we the development of our Ghanaian languages is coming from the entertainment industry they are the ones who are creating new words for what we are doing, that the words do not exist, and wow. this, is, this is this is a sad reality because to develop <laughs> the language, you need a language board. A language board is supposed to create new words every year to tell what new words have been added, what new words exist. Um, I remember um, some organization in Ghana sent me some technical. A very short abstract of a very technical um, on AI. They said, uh, is it possible? They asked if it was possible to translate it into tree. And I read the text. Uh, we we tried with Kaya, and we realized that of course this is a new area. There are a lot of words that are, we do not have. 
What is artificial mm. intelligence in tree? How do we really <laughs> say it? Or what is deep learning in tree? How do we really say right. it? How do we how do we explain it? So these were things that are, are, are non-existent in our language, I must say. And if mm. uh, if there's a language board, then it's possible that we can collaborate with them to create these new words that will then be used by everyone. Um, and I, so since then, for instance, I've been trying to write a lot of uh, mathematics now in three in fancy in my own language. Uh, I started wow. this last year, That's and awesome. I realized a lot of words do not exist. And I keep struggling on how do I say calculus? How do I say this to someone? How do and so. <laughs> A language board would have been easy to just help translate or develop new words that uh, that did not exist. Uh, unfortunately, they do not exist. We do not have language boards, so a lot of the words uh, on our in our local languages are being created by entertainments. You know, like Sarkodie, like um, um, all these guys. They create new words. They they readily do them in their songs. They just say poo poo and it has a meaning and everybody understands and unfortunately we are not doing this for our language itself so the language is mm -hmm. losing its strength uh, and it's 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 uh it's beauty in general right. and this is the these are some of the the things that uh when we started developing this uh kaya app i realized about the our local languages so there's really a need that we all contribute in ways that we can to sustain our language. Um, most of our young people, they, they just know the very surface words, but things like idioms, proverbs, and stuff are all getting lost. Yeah. And a language right. translation or a, a good language translation app will be able to preserve the language such that if, you, if it is an idiom, it will give you a good translation of it as well. Interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. I have a couple of questions in the chat, so I want to ask those. Um, somebody's asking, please, would like to know about AI and education. But so in, in here, I would want to add on top of his question that how is your work um, on Kaya, um, how are you connecting that with, let's, just, let's say, basic education in, in our schools? Because we know that, as you mentioned, we're losing our own language. We teach in schools with English. Right, so a child would grow up and they know how to speak English more than their local language. And even if they're able to speak their local language, like you said, there are certain words that they will not be privy to. Right now, I think almost every Ghanaian language I know has been sort of, what was what's even the right, right word? It's not thick, like it's not deep. You know, diluted, like if diluted. I think you just yeah, they are diluted, diluted. thank you. If somebody shallow. speaks a certain kind of chi, then they will say, oh, yeah. you are speaking elective chi. They don't even understand yeah, it. And yeah, I, yeah, I, I was yeah. listening to a song, and the song was in Eve. But yeah. the, the words the guy was using in it, when I, I gave the song to somebody else to listen, the guy said, but the way the guy is speaking the Eve in the song, you know, it, it doesn't sound right. But the song <laughs> is, is Eve. You know, the guy was saying the language, like the language is diluted and stuff like that. How do we connect all this work that you are doing to education and help the basic schools or the, 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 the family, the family system in Ghana to be able to adapt and then build up on our educational system with us helping us to, to understand our own languages through AI. Yeah, so um, this is what I, when we started, I said that um, there is still a lot of room uh, in our country, uh, in our society, in this space of ai so we can use ai to teach people uh, we can use this tool we can develop products on them to teach people how to pronounce words how to pronounce basic Ghanaian words or how to say certain sentences or how to use them or use them to teach them actually some of the things that uh we know so yeah uh, we we basically it, once this tool is out uh all is left with is others to take aspects of the two because we have the data we have the we have uh, we have this uh, data which is readily accessible of course what i did not say is that for kaya app um is free for 500 words but if you want to go beyond that 
uh, we encourage people to pay one dollar every month uh, as a way for us to keep going with the data contribution as well uh, so um, i feel that this we can use it we can just leverage on it as a way to train people uh, if you go to the market for example for children in english there are products out there that help them to pronounce words like they press something and it says ball they press um, a button it says basket they press a button, another button it says tree i feel that we can develop all these this tool in a way that will begin to help children even learn the language really from scratch from as kids if we can develop some child pronunciation tool based on this already done then they will be able to learn the language from scratch for instance if you meet uh, a Ghanaian who has who has who was born in us or germany and live there for many years even if their parents teach them something like tree when they speak you immediately realize that they are they are pronouncing the words like, you know, <laughs> brutalizing the tree exactly so <laughs> these are the things that we can use we can develop further on such a tool to help people even get the right pronunciations of words for instance um in the education sector i think that um i remember when we were developing the kaya uh some of the some uh i i gave a presentation at the ghana linguistics association or association of linguists uh, which is the the body where all the people working on Ghanaian languages uh, where they kind of meet to discuss and when I presented and I told them about the extinction of some Ghanaian languages I feel somebody thought I was saying this uh, to get money or to be able to go and take money from some <laughs> funding agencies uh, because they did not understand what I was saying because the extinction does not mean that the, the language is it will be lost within some days it means that right. over a certain number of years because of how we are not using the language in, in its real sense mm -hmm. a lot of the words we will not be able to say them or use them again and we'll be replacing all these words by english words or by right. some words which are kind of anonymized words or like coinage words so maybe someone will say uh, but mm. this is not this is not a right tree or tree word to use or tree yes. sentence to say so we, we begin to use these kind of words as coinage words that in, in the in the general sense may just take over the real words you get it okay. and nobody will right. understand well if you say the real thing someone will say you are speaking elective tree <laughs> so these are these are the things that we can use these tools for to train for people to learn the language for people to also build on and hopefully my aim is that we can even create some generative stuff from these language tools as well like chatbots mm. that will be able to help people read or learn the language better like right. if i say this what does it really mean and to engage in this kind of sense in our local languages awesome um so Clarence is asking what is the gap between machine learning and artificial intelligence yeah so of course um artificial intelligence is very broad uh, machine learning is, is one aspect of it uh, there are many aspects of it so for instance so there are many aspects of this there's robotics in it there are many things that are involved in artificial intelligence um so um uh, i'm not sure if by gap you mean um uh, gap in finance or gap in learning and training uh, but the gap is that you know for ai for ai it includes things like robotics and for machine learning it doesn't need robotics is uh, another aspect and uh, another thing altogether so there is a big gap as in okay you you have machine learning you have robotics can you include them can you can you synergy can you create a synergy between them or what can we do what can we do such that we bridge certain gaps so there if you go to the farm you can input some things in the ground some some sensors or if someone is sick you can put some sensors on the person's body to read certain signals 
or certain information from the person. And then you develop your tools on these things. So there are some gaps between these things. So as I said already, um, the global AI market is already 50 billion um, as of 2021. By 2025, it's going to be 200 billion. Uh, by 2023, uh, 2030, it's going to be about 115 trillion. Uh, but in Africa, it's very little. It's just 66 million. It's not even 100 million, you know. So it's not even uh, a tenth of a billion already. So the right. huge gap, huge gap. The, for even in Africa, the gap is really, really huge. And there's a need to encourage people to come in. Uh, this is what I keep saying. The need to encourage people to come in. And people should not make it look like they are a turf war where it's like, I am doing this. I don't want anybody to come into it or to steal right. it or to steal, but to share the knowledge, to share the data, to share the skill and to improve more. Because uh, as of last year, there's already about 300,000 jobs globally for things like data science, which are not yet even taken. So right. if we can train 50,000 people or 10,000 people, then it means that we have created 10,000 jobs that all over the world, we can send Ghanaians to go and take over and to take these jobs, which will also help them create money and send money back home as well. Awesome. Um, so Nana Sam, your boy is asking, he's asking two questions. Um, it's a guy. He's asking two questions. But I want to, I want to ask the last question first before the previous one. He says, the STT model developed by Ghana NLP, is it fine-tuned to transcribe English with the Ghanaian accent or it's for just local language trans transcriptions? So, um, yeah, so this, uh, this is important. Um, so currently what we are doing um, is, you know, if you want to do um, uh, the ASR models, the automatic speech recognition models, um, mm -hmm. you need a lot of data. You need a lot of data and you need data that is able to um, do whether either it is uh, to be able to, to even do accents transcriptions as well accents uh, dialects uh, if somebody is tree if somebody is ever and is speaking English or is speaking tree how how does it look how does it, how does the person speak so I would not want to talk too deep about the models we have developed at Ghana uh, at uh, Ghana NLP but I just want to say that if you want to create uh, automatic speech recognition, you need huge amounts of data and data that is able to, uh, even for things like dialect or accents, it should be able to take care of these things as well.